I'm delighted to have uh, Professor Mark Anderson. Mark is currently at uh, Johns Hopkins University, which is located in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, Mark is now the chair of uh, the Department of Medicine at uh, Johns Hopkins. Before that, which was about six months ago, about six months ago he moved to uh, Baltimore, and before that he was the chief of medicine at um, the University of Iowa in Iowa City. And before that he was in Vanderbilt University, which is about four and a half hours south of here in Nashville. Education-wise, he got his MD and PhD, both from the University of Minnesota. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember. That University part is of correct. Minnesota. Yeah. University of Minnesota, and then we went to uh, Stanford for his residency and fellowship from there to uh, Vanderbilt. Now, Mark and I date back uh, a few years, and we even shared the Ladoop Foundation Award recently, which was a lot of fun. And um, really, uh, Mark has done some beautiful work, and in particular, the work on uh, uh, chem kinase. His interest is mostly on regulatory pathways in cardiac cells. And the um, most uh, important contribution was on the chem kinase pathway and its role in heart failure and arrhythmias. Uh, and today we'll hear about something different from others, which is a metabolic mechanism for cardiac testing. So I'm eager to hear about this because I know about an existing controversy, which is IF versus calcium clock in the sinus uh, SA nodal cells, and maybe now we have a three-day, three, three, you know, three, three ways controversy that will be uh, starting. So, Mark, thanks for coming. Thank you. Peter, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to all of you. Can can you all? Hear me? Okay. Yes, you can. Okay. So if you can't hear me, if I start to slur my words, you know, make you should shout out. It's okay with me if you ask questions as we go. I mean, but the time is the time. So I'm going to talk to you about something completely different, and uh, I'll say that I believe that this controversy that you're touched upon, this this so-called calcium clock, and some people call it the cell membrane clock. It's kind of become a straw person controversy because I think it's broadly accepted that there's an integrated response for cardiac pacing, but what's missing is the, the metabolic piece. And I think that through uh, no fault of our own, or at least through no particular intention, building tools to ask other questions, we ended up stumbling upon something that we think is really interesting. It just came out last week, and I'm going to mostly focus on that story. So. Um, to start out, I'm going to tell, tell you what I, what I, in one slide about cardiac pacing. So cardiac pacing is maybe the, you know, one of the most ancient paradigms to be addressed by people that study uh, bioelectricity. And it turns out through the, you know, there's a, an infinite number of solutions that can take you to automaticity. And, and, um, but, but I think that despite that, uh, that kind of dizzying complexity, that, that the interface between biology and modeling has taught us a couple things that probably 90% of the field that studies pacemaking in, in, in heart would come to embrace. And so this is a, this is a, a depiction of a, a, a pacemaker cell action potential. It's sort of slow and lopy. Uh, the upstroke is, is actually uh, graded by uh, voltage-gated calcium current. And, um, and what's peculiar here, and would be sick in other cells, but is the duty of these automatic cells, is this phase four depolarization, the slow rise of membrane potential up into the threshold for opening of, of, of voltage-gated calcium channels that actually triggers the action potential. And, and although we can bicker, and, and sinus node cells come in slightly different flavors, the core sinus node cells uh, accomplish, there's, there's a, a waning of, of, of repolarizing current. There's the, 
the onset of this funny current, which is mostly carried through HCN4. And we know this is important for cardiac pacing because, um, because people that are born with mutations in that channel need pacemakers more than people who aren't. Um, but but I, I think it's become <coughs> evident through the work of many people, but most popularized by Ed Licata, that, um, that there's an interface between these membrane currents uh, and, 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 and calcium handling machinery. So it turns out for mechanically purposed cells, we're pretty comfortable about this phenomenon of VC excitation contraction coupling, that the electrical properties of the membrane, which are so complicated, are really there to grade and uh, the release of, the regenerative release of calcium from intracellular stores to drive myofilament interactions and allow the heart to contract and then to relax. So these pacemaker cells are entirely different. And although they they quiver a little bit, they have no clear mechanical purpose. They're instead electrical oscillators. But if you measure their capacity to have intracellular calcium handling um, indexed for the, the, the cell membrane uh, area, it's as large or greater than mechanically purposed cells. And yet, these perhaps primordial cardiac cells, instead of releasing calcium to myofilaments, they, they release it into this subsarcolemal space, and that helps to grade calcium-sensitive conductances. In particular, it, gr it grades this sodium-calcium exchanger, which, because of the stoichiometry of the exchange, exchanges three sodiums for a single calcium, moving a net charge inward. And, and I think the best evidence suggests that that is the critical event for the um, terminal rise of phase four. And that we believe that the IF channel is most important for basal automaticity, um, but not so not as important for acceleration. And there is some controversy around that, but there isn't much controversy that these systems are, are coupled and interdependent. So that's, that's the starting point. But the piece that's really missing is the metabolic piece. How does the, how does the pacemaker cell know when to go, to go faster and what, what supplies the ATP uh, for this process? And in particular, um, the, this, this process is directly dependent on the expensive um, activity of the, of the circa, the, the circulomal, I mean circoplasmic, uh, endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. And of course, the membrane potential is indirectly uh, reliant on, on the ATP consumed by the sodium potassium exchanger. So I think the metabolism is the most interesting missing piece. And one of the things that, that really created a kind of gateway discovery was when two groups uh, published the um, identity of a new of a new potassium, of a new calcium channel, but albeit one that's been posited and, and understood at a pharmacological and, and systems level for almost 50 years. And this is this mitochondrial calcium uniporter. And both groups came to find this channel using this fundamentally similar approaches of bioinformatics and um, taking, um, comparing the, the mitochondrial proteome, as it was known, um, contrasting it with organisms where, the, in yeast in particular, where this, this mitochondrial calcium uniporter was known not to exist based on functional studies, and demanding certain things of the information like, like it looked like an ion channel, that it had at least two transmembrane domains. And when they did that, they were able to find four, um, 14 candidates, a kind of a double handful of candidates, and they were able to, to, to burrow down and identify the same channel. And that opened up a real uh, opportunity to ask questions about the role of this channel. Now this channel has been known to be important for a long time simply because mitochondrial <coughs> metabolism and, and oxidative phosphorylation rely on calcium for, to kind of goose the system, to make, to make extra ATP production. And that's been known really even before this time by classical studies of, of McCormick and, and Denton. And, and what they found is that there were, there were, um, there were the dehydrogenases, actually three of them, that rely on calcium for the maximum activity. And they do that, they exist in a complex, but they do that because they have phosphatases that are activated by calcium and the phosphorylated forms of the enzymes are most active. So there was, it's been known biochemically that there's a coupling between mitochondrial calciumetry 
and metabolism. And moreover, we know, and I'm not going to touch about this too much, but, but there's a, a whole literature and story that mitochondrial calcium overload contributes to um, cell death under disease stress. And that actually was a, was a point of entry where we started tinkering with the system. But on the physiological side, what happens is mitochondrial calcium entry ends up complexing with three dehydrogenases, the pyruvate dehydrogenase, isocitrate dehydrogenase, and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. And, and, the, and, the, and the calcium activated forms of those enzymes uh, produce more reduced NAD and NADP, so NADPH and NADH. And those reducing equivalents are critical for, um, for helping electron transport to be more, more efficient and ultimately making more ATP. So there's a physiological role, and there might be an area where a, a time when this system is overwhelmed by calcium, driving, the, driving autophagy and cell um, death decisions. So we're going to talk really about the physiology of this talk, and also say that we were um, informed to a certain extent when Torn Finkel's group at the end of uh, last, last year published this paper where, um, surprisingly, uh, despite the, the supposedly indispensable nature of this, of this uh, calcium conductance, uh, found that, that mice where it was constitutively um, and globally knocked out were viable. Now, the truth be told, it's pretty interesting. They were viable, they were embryonically lethal in some of the usual mouse strains like C57, Black 6, but in, in various outbred strains, they had almost no phenotype. And in both cases, calcium entry to mitochondria was completely blocked. So it wasn't that there was tinkering or enabling resources of uh, redundant proteins. It's that you know when we study a, a, a gene, one gene at a time, it's important to remember we're doing it in the background of tens of thousands of other functioning genes. But that being said, I wanted to show you what, what this looked like. So this is an assay to measure calcium uptake into mitochondria. And the way it works is that an isolated uh, cell has its cell membrane permeabilized, but its mitochondrial membrane left intact. And we add in a, they add in a dye that is a calcium reporter dye that doesn't have access to the mitochondria, but has access by virtue of the permeabilization of the cell membrane to the, to the cytoplasm. And then they spike with calcium, that's the blue, it goes up, but then that, number, that amount retreats because it's being absorbed into the mitochondria. And with a certain number of pulses, it eventually gives way because the mitochondrial uh, transition pore opens up and gives up and, and loses the inner membrane potential, which is a critical part of the driving force for calcium. But in these mice where the MCU was knocked out, something very different happens. You just get the stepwise progression because the mitochondria are no longer in the business of rapid calcium uptake. So you spike it and it just keeps going until the dye starts to look like it's saturated. And on the other hand, you could uh, use, a, in this combination, a, a, a dye um, to, um, to interrogate the calcium environment inside the mitochondria and provide isoproteranol, a stimulus for, for calcium mobilization in cells. And what you could see in a wild type, there's a slow accretion and rise of calcium inside the, inner, in the mitochondrial matrix. But in the knockout cell, there's nothing happening. So although this doesn't say it's the only pathway for calcium entry into mitochondria, over this kind of a time course, uh, it's, it's, it's really a long time in town. So you could knock this out, and this is what it looked like. And when they did that, they found that there were certain things that they might predict, that there was a low enough calcium that, that one of these dehydrogenase, prove dehydrogenase, um, had less activity. That's what we predict because it's calcium sensitive compared to wild type. Uh, you, you could see that it, um, it it has more phosphorylation. Remember, there's a there's a cal the, the reason that it's calcium regulated is because there's a calcium sensitive phosphatase that is in the business of dephosphorylating it to make it more active. So it's it's more phosphorylated. And these mice, uh, through a variety of uh, assays, are a little bit you know poofier. They're less they're less. They're, they're less strong, less robust. This is a forearm. I mean, this is a, a mouse chin-up, I think. Um, and, and they're not as good as their wild-type counterparts, which was kind of what you might predict. So that's what we do. And I would just say that we came to this really because 
Um, a number of years ago, uh, the, the person who started my lab with me, Yujin Wu, uh, who has great technical expertise, learned to isolate pacemaker cells from mice. And when the calcium clock concept for pacing came into being, we were intensely interested uh, because of our interest in the calcium sensitive uh, enzyme called CAM kinase, which beyond this I won't talk about. But uh, we, we've published a number of things that, that suggest CAM kinase and calcium are important for, for various parts of the fight or flight response. And that when, and, and we tell a lot of, we've told a lot of stories that when CAM kinase is excessively active in a variety of kind of disease model scenarios, that it contributes to um, to arrhythmias and dysfunction, and also part of that part of that phenotype is a is is sick sinus syndrome or sinus node defect, um, and 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 possibly that sinus node defect contributes to the excess mortality that diabetic animals have in the setting of myocardial infarction compared to non-diabetic. So we're interested in that. We're also interested in if we shut the front door to calcium in the in the mitochondria, might that be uh, might that be beneficial? And also, we published a paper a couple of years ago that that suggested chem kinases in mitochondria, where it plays a role in stress responses, and one of its targets uh, might be the MCU. So we built mice like this, really as as kind of part of a toolkit to ask questions about chem kinases. So this is what the the MCU looks like. It's a it's a two membrane spanning protein, as was it was selected to be from the um, from the informatics approach. It's it's highly conserved, and it has this so-called dying motif of negatively charged amino acids in the core domain that help it to be selective for, for calcium uh, over other um, other ions. It has a kind of anomalous wall fraction that affects a little conductive sodium being bound to calcium in the absence of calcium, but that's not a real life scenario. And we, based on work that others had done, made this dominant negative uh, transgenic mouse. So we did it by just charge reversal mutations within the core domain. And because others had suggested that this channel comes together like a potassium channel or other channels as a, as a, as a, as a quatrimer, that, that, that a dominant negative effect would be possible. <coughs> so I'm going to show you data that was just published last week, and it, it is almost it's a group effort, like all these, but it, but it was really driven by two people, by uh, Eugene Wu, who we've uh, been together now almost 20 years, um, and he is the one that really built, built our position in, in, in pacemaker biology. And then Tyler Rasmussen, who's an MSTP student uh, at Iowa, who just graduated a couple weeks ago and is finishing up another paper on on, the, on what this what this mutation does in the rest of the body. So we built this mouse, and we, we did it by transgenically expressing this dominant negative mutant form of MCU and, and driving it under the control of the alpha myosin heavy chain promoter. So it expresses ubiquitously in, in, in cardiomyocyte cells. And here we could see that we tagged it uh, with a the, with the MIC tag so we could follow it. And we see that it only expresses in heart, not skeletal muscle or liver. Um, and I don't know if you can really see this, but you can kind of see this. So, so the, the green is the MIC tag. So these are wild type mice, and this is dominant negative. And, and one thing we knew is that the pacemaker cells are, are, are under the control of the alpha mice and heavy chain promoter. But we wanted to make sure that it was present in a variety of cells. And after we got our phenotype, we wanted to see if it was present in pacemaker cells. Those you can identify because they're in part because of by anatomic location and because they're enriched in HCN4, this so-called pacemaker parent I mentioned briefly. And you can see only the dominant and negative have these have, have evidence of the of the um, of the transgene expression. So then we did uh, the kind of usual suspect things. We we assay, well how, how does the heart work now that it has this dominant and negative expression in the cells? And the the answer is that under these conditions, so this is a resting heart rate of, of 400, which is a kind of, this is a relaxed uh, rate for a mouse. Um, that the answer is, it's, it's pretty normal. But we didn't see any any uh, major differences. This is uh, an Eastertide mouse. This is a lightly dusted, a little bit of midazolam. Yeah, it is lightly, but not completely. I mean, it shouldn't drive. 
but it can probably still talk in a cocktail bar. <laughs> <laughs> We can lay it on the flat and stroke it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll say nice things. So, um, so we did this assay I told you about. We took the, the heart muscle cells. Now, these are not sinus node cells. Um, these are just uh, atrial myocytes. But we we did we repeated this assay in the wild type where we 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 we, we pulse with calcium. It gets taken up into mitochondria, and that can happen repetitively. And these dominant negative cells behave just like we had hoped. They they have the stair step because the mitochondria don't rapidly take up any uh, calcium. And then we interrogated for the activity and the phosphorylation state of uh, Pruve dehydrogenase. The, the, the enzyme, the antibodies are best for this enzyme complex and we could assay it um, you know, under a way that recipe that seemed to work. And you can clearly see that the dominant negative form is, 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 is highly phosphorylated compared to the wild type and the activity. So it looked like uh, we, were, we were blocking rapid calcium entry and that at least based on the, the information that was telegraphed to us from this enzyme complex, it suggested that calcium is lower, in, in, you know, even under, under um, uh, resting conditions in, in these dominant negative <coughs> expressing types. So one thing we, we kind of learned pretty early is that these mice in vivo uh, had very ever, slightly lower heart rates, but when you gave the mice a pterinol, as here, that their heart rates didn't accelerate nearly as much as wild type. And this is on a percentage-wise basis. And here's some example tracings, the wild type at rest, and then after isoproteranol, and the dominant negative at rest, and after isoproteranol. So um, even though uh, th there's not so much difference in the resting heart, it, it looks like the, there's a kind of a relatively selectively impaired ability of the heart to accelerate. So, we wanted to know, I mean, isoproteranol is, um, is that what I just showed? Well, um, so there's this, this, uh, I apologize. So this is supposed to be an activity. <laughs> there, we did two things. We implanted them with ECG telemeters, and we injected various doses of isoproteranol. But we also just watched them um, over time. And with these telemeters, you can bin their activity states. And then we can plot heart rate against spontaneous activity. And we saw something very similar. That at rest, the heart rates were pretty similar. But when the mice got busy and physically active, that their heart, the heart rate acceleration was markedly impaired in these dominant negative lines. And we wondered, so, I mean, you know, how, how, we, we set up this tissue-specific model really to interrogate the heart in general, and we found this, this phenotype of, of impaired heart rate acceleration. We turned to another um, technique that a postdoc had developed in the lab a few years earlier when we first started to work with sinus node, which was a gene painting technique. And we borrowed this from Kevin Donahue. He's done this with uh, pig atria and other tissues. But really, you take, you take the gene of interest that you want to deliver, and you put it in an interesting bio, uh, material called paloxomer. And this is a material that, at body temperature, is a gel that, at zero degrees, is a liquid. And so it, it, it helps you to kind of stick the gene on. And we took advantage of the fact that the mouse pacemaker cell is really just a few, it, where the pacemaker is, is a few cell layers thick. So we developed a technique to paint in the area of the pacemaker without infecting the entire heart. And um, so what's intended here is this is a, this is a, a, a non-painted uh, uh, sinus node area. And the red is the HCN4. That's that's one of the markers for um, for the pacemaker cell. And this is a, a mouse that's been painted. So the, the MIC tag, again, denotes expression of the dominant negative MCU. And you can see it's not it's not just on the sinus node, but it's not on the, on the, ret on the left atrium, and it's not in the ventricle either. And um, so this is the sinus node of the painted heart. And what we found when we took these hearts out and we, we, we studied their rates in, in a Langendorf perfusion apparatus, so we're, we're perfusing the aorta retrovaguely to, to feed the coronaries. Um, but the, the control virus was able to, um, to have a heart rate acceleration that looked like this in the open dots, and the dominant negative had, was impaired, particularly at these upper rates. So it, it suggested to us that 
but really the, the effects we were observing in vivo um, could be focused down to the cytostome. Yes? I was just going to say, do you do the painting ex vivo? Or you no, you do the painting, you do a thoracotomy, and I mean, like, and, and you do the painting, and, and it's with a single whistle, um, and then you and you sew them back up, and you come back, and it was so you paint them from outside the heart. Yeah, yeah, right. You paint them outside the heart. So did, Kevin Donnie was published in certain research. I mean, he gets full thickness transduction in a pig atrium. So he was looking at. You know, so this is actually not so hard. Um, so, but but what is happening at the level of the pacemaker cell? So that was really what we wanted to to ask next. And so these are these are these are three different uh, mouse pacemaker cells. Again, they're not mechanically purpose cells. They're kind of long, wormy-looking cells that barely kind of twitch spontaneously. And we, uh, well, we, Dr. Wu, Eugen Wu, infected them with uh, mitopericam, which is a is a uh, fluorescent probe for. Um, uh, uh, calcium that is targeted to mitochondria. And what you can see is that here's the, the mitoparacam. This is another dye that, that, that um, marks mitochondria and that there's a substantial amount of overlap when we superimpose those figures. And here's two pacemaker cells that are um, patched and then we measure at baseline and after isopaterenol. And you can see that like in, in Torn Finkel's paper, except this time in, in pacemaker cells, you can see that isopaterenol causes uh, the calcium to rise in mitochondria, but not in, uh, in dominant negative, uh, not in cells, in this case, that are perfused with a, with a chemical called IU360, which is an antagonist for this MCU channel. And this is what the summary data look like here, that uh, in the absence of this MCU antagonist, calcium rises, after isopaterenol is applied to the to the bat, but not in the presence of, of RU360. And so it looked like we could we could uh, and, and we um, so so the reason that calcium is supposed to be important for engaging metabolism and oxidative phosphorylation is because when it activates dehydrogenases, they make more reducing equivalents. And you can measure the, the relative uh, reduction and the presence of NADH over NAD and NADPH over NADP uh, through a, a standard uh, uh, fluorescent assay. So this this is an, is, is an example of such an assay where we give isoproteinol and we measure um, NA, the, the ratio of reduced NADH NAD, and you can see that it goes up. But in the presence of RU360, this antagonist that blocks the MCU, channel, it doesn't go up at all. So calcium entry to the mitochondria in pacemaker cells um, causes an increase in, in, in NADH, like we would probably expect. And this is an example in, the, in wild type and, and dominant <coughs> negative um, uh, pacemaker cells. We can see that there's a rise, and, and that we routinely didn't see that rise in these dominant negative so we think that either by dialyzing in a small molecule, and this molecule is actually tough to work with because it's so polar, it's a congener of ruthenium red, and that people have variable effects when they put it in the bath, but if we put it in the pipette, and so it's not uh, forced to cross a cell membrane, it works very quickly. Um, that small molecule did something similar to our genetic approach. So both of these, both of these approaches to block the MCU current reduce the, um, the response of increasing, reducing equivalence in the presence of isoprotein. So what happens to rate? And one really uh, alluring feature of studying these pacemaker cells is that they beat spontaneously at a, at a, at a, in a predictable way and without any agonist stimulation. And so here's an example of spontaneous action potential traces at baseline of, of wild type um, pacemaker cells and then after isoproterium go faster and, and, and that's what you see in these open bars in response to progressive increases in the concentration of isoproterium on the back. But when, when we give RU360, what you see is that that, that that acceleration is impaired and that's what this black is here. And so we asked the question, if this is really impairing 
the capacity for um, reducing equivalents to, if, if blocking the MCU is really blocking the reducing equivalents that eventually make oxidative phosphorylation more effective, can we rescue this effect by dialyzing the ATP? If this is a kind of a, a energy shortage, can we, can we see a difference? And, and so when we dialyzed in, in ATP, we could recover uh, the, the rate of acceleration with isoproterenol even when we block the MC current. So this suggests, but doesn't prove, that, um, that, that there is an ATP sensitive process that is um, corrupted when you, when you block the MCU current and can be recovered by dialysis of exogenous ATP. How much ATP is this? This is two millimoles. These, these are fairly small cells, aren't they? Yeah. And, and in our experience in mouse atrial myocytes, which are bigger, mm -hmm. you, if, you dial, if you use a whole cell pipette with no ATP in it, you dialyze out nucleotides quick enough that the KTP current comes on very mm -hmm. quickly. So I'm curious, what's your baseline? Condition. What what ATP did you have at the then, or what, what was the type condition? That's a good question. I think that there is no added ATP, and that these are taken to a point where their 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 baseline uh, automaticity is 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 steady. Because in principle, I guess the opposite should occur to what you're talking about. And if you you know if if, if you can add ATP and get the effect, you should be able to knock it down and, and replicate the IU360 effect without IU360. Um, yeah, could, could be. Now let me show you a couple more experiments because we don't see, so we didn't, we didn't interrogate IKATP, but we did interrogate calcium current and IF and we see no sensitivity whatsoever. So it may, it may be that, that we're still not dialyzing to the level that where we see, I, I can't <coughs> Uh, yeah. Is the RU380 put in the pipette? The RU360 is put in the pipette. And then you are, when you say dialyzing ATP, you mean or refuse. Adding it into the pipette. During the recording? So like, these are paired recordings. No, no, no. No, okay. So, no, no, so, okay. so, well, no, no, these are paired recordings. These are all paired recordings. But they're, um, this one has no RU360 and, and, um, and it, it's, Baseline and after isoproterenol. This one we added RU360 at baseline and after isoproterenol. But you didn't add RU360 and then add ATP in the same cell. We added RU360 at baseline and after isoproterenol. We added RU360 and ATP in the same cells. But, but the ATP is in the pipette from the beginning. It's beginning. in the pipette from right. the beginning. That's what I meant. So that you don't have paired RU380 and then the ATP. Yeah. 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 We're not, we don't have like yeah. co-dialysis. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. But how would that help? No, I think it would address Colin's yeah. question of is there some something because in atrial cells it's clear you you couldn't do the experiment the ATP okay. dependent channel would be so the current would be so big you wouldn't be able to okay that, that's a good it's an interesting yeah. point so when we, we did the same experiment looking at the genetic model so we took we took the, the dominant negative um, we took we took uh, we took sinus node cells and cultured them either with a control virus or with a dominant negative uh, MCU expressing virus. And we looked at baseline and after isoproterenol, and we could, that, that's what we see in the open circles. And in the inhibited, we, we saw that we, we had that same defect in acceleration with isoproterenol, and we could recover that by, by adding ATP to the Just to keep pursuing the <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, a point. So, so this, this, it seems like why go to the virus experiment? What, what about just your dominant negative transgenic? Why don't you just look at the SA9 cells? Mm -hmm. We did, but we weren't, I mean, so you might be shocked to hear, this isn't the actual order we did the experiments. We first, <laughs> we first, you know, we were making the mouse and then you know, we did some RE360 experiments and that was pretty interesting and so we had the virus so then we did that, then we got the mouse. And then there were some background changes we had to make in the mouse. And then it turned out those cells are harder to isolate. They're less happy cells. So I mean, there are a number of, but, but they do the same thing. Oh, so this is a different strain. This is something like C57. Well, these you are, see the penis thing? no, no, these oh, are, okay. no, these are just, these are SA nodal cells, isolated, cultured in a dish, 
infected with virus, studied in 48 hours. And so you see that there's, they're actually the rates are slower um, at baseline, but on a percentage-wise basis, they accelerate to the, or actually slightly greater. So there's some remodeling in culture, but in either case, the phenotype of impaired rate acceleration with dominant neck, with, in, with inhibiting the MCU was, was the same, and in both cases, we could rescue it by dialyzing it. So, I mean, one question would be, well, what is, what is, and uh, what is ATP doing? I think we did. I, I take that back. I think it's four millimolar. So, um, but we we did a series of control experiments to see, uh, in the absence of isoproteinol, what happens if you monkey with these systems? What happens if we take away uh, ATP? What happens if we give ATP? And what happens if we give RU360? And what what these data show, and these these data show is that we didn't see any difference in basal rates, it, it, as if this system was dispensable for basal automaticity. And when we looked at the effect of, um, of, of ATP on rate acceleration, we didn't see any, it didn't add anything, it didn't change anything. It suggested that, that in the absence of, of, blocking, or of blocking the MCU, ATP wasn't rate limiting for um, for rate acceleration. So RU360, or, or I mean the MCU and ATP didn't appear to be an issue for basal automaticity. And in the absence of blocking MCU, ATP didn't seem to be limited, limiting under our experimental conditions for our rate acceleration. So in your experiments, in the control experiments, especially how long uh, after you form a patch? Uh, 